And there were other places where they would go and they would conquer a tribe and they had choices. They could let them go where they conquered them the next day or, or they could kill them all, which leaves a bad feeling. Or, or they could say, you come work for us and you won't be allowed to take up arms against us anymore. And that was slavery. And then there were people who just liked being uh, stronger than the next person and holding them down and all that. So they, all kind of stuff was going on at the time. But Jesus didn't come protesting slavery. Instead, he did what? He pointed at the right way to live. And if any of y'all lived right, where would slavery be? It'd be gone. Where do you start with somebody? Did you go to somebody who's uh, doing something horribly wrong and say, would you quit and then I'll tell you about Jesus? Or do you go tell them about Jesus and they learn when they learn to love Jesus, they learn to quit? Which way works better? Anybody ever been to New Orleans? I lost my little truck in downtown New Orleans. I blew a hose right in the middle of traffic. And by the time I got out of traffic and all my, my uh, water the radiator looked more like milk. In other words, it blew the head and, and the, the uh, oil got in with the water and it emulsified and it looked like milk. I, I lost it down there because there's so much traffic. There was no place to get. We did something. See, one guy washing his side, washing he got his hose and he tried to save it, but it was too late. It was, it was gone. There's so much traffic. But you know what they got down there? Some horse-drawn carriages. How well trained do you think those horses have to be to intermingle with the traffic in downtown New Orleans? Pretty good. What if you had some newbie on the job and he went out there and he's trying to figure out how to hook that carriage up to the horse? He, he put the carriage out there and thought that the, the back was the front and he put the, the horse facing the carriage to push it around. What kind of traffic jam do you think you would have out there as soon as they, as soon as they pulled out in the traffic? It would get pretty rough with it. You don't want to get the cart before the horse long way to come to that little cliche, but, but it, you don't want to get the cart before the horse. You're in for a wreck. And so what had to happen first was people had to learn the right way to go, and as we learn the right way to go, we do less bad things. How many of you, since you started following Jesus, do less things against Jesus? I pray that every one of us do less things against His way. I didn't say you were perfect yet. And the things I do wrong are not okay. But I do less things wrong because I do want to please Him. I do want to love Him. And I do want not only to see heaven, but I want the people around me to see heaven. Does that make sense? So, Paul is a prisoner at this time. And what's funny about Paul is Paul doesn't see himself as a victim. We live in an age where everybody wants to be a victim because if you're a victim, that means somebody owes you something or you have a right to be mad. Listen, I'm a victim of sin. I'm mad at my sin, but I'm so thankful for a Savior who offers me a better way. Paul didn't see himself as a victim. He was out preaching Jesus. The emperor and everybody else got a little nervous about that. Don't you be talking about Jesus. I mean, they don't do that today. Does anybody tell people, don't you be talking about Jesus here. Don't talk about Jesus at this school or this workplace or, or this public venue. It's strange, but it's, it's getting that way again, isn't it? But, but he kept on talking about Jesus. They put him in jail. He said he was preaching the good news. We're in the New Living Translation because I want to tell you the story. I want to tell you the story. This is more American English story form about Paul and, and, and Philemon. He says, I was out telling the good news about Jesus. And from our brother Timothy, I was, I'm was i writing to Philemon, our beloved co-worker. Let me tell you about Philemon. Philemon lived over not far from Ephesus in a town called Colossae, where we get the book of Colossians. Anyway, he was there, and, and, and Paul went and told him about Jesus, and Philemon was a slave owner. Can you tell sinners about Jesus? Is it okay? Is it okay to tell sinners about Jesus? We're called to. Go ye therefore and make disciples. In other words, people who are not following Jesus, to follow Jesus. So he went to the slave owner from Colossae about Jesus. And then listen to what it says about it. He says, our beloved co-worker, you mean a sinner can serve God? Let me ask you, those who have accepted Jesus made him Lord in your life. And by the way, if you want to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, and we have the recipe on the wall over here, it's in the Bible. In Romans 10, 9, it says, confess with your mouth. In other words, you have to do it. That Jesus is your Lord, the one you're going to follow. Believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead. You will be saved. In other words, you find the new leader in your life. And you know who he is. And you know what he's done for you. And says, you will be saved. Now, when you're saved, you quit doing everything wrong. Or you are shy today. No, we didn't quit doing everything wrong. 
Well, I wish we did. They did. And, and I could point at you, but I know I've got enough problems, and, and I want to, but I do less because I have a new leader. And I'm getting better at it. So when Philemon accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior, did he quit doing everything wrong? No. That, that time between when you first accept Jesus and you're being perfected or maturing towards Christ and when you get there, and by the way, we don't get there to that perfection until we get there to that perfection. Amen? Say that again. We don't get there to that perfection of not sinning until we get there to that perfection of heaven which has no sin. Right? We don't get there to the end. And that time from when we start until we get there is called sanctification. Becoming more and more like Jesus. Is Philemon there yet? No, he's not there. And Daryl's not here. So let's pray as we get into the story. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. In spite of me. Thank you for drawing us here this morning to hear your word. I pray, Father, for every one of us, Lord. Uh, and I'll pray especially for me. I'll pray everybody's prays especially for them. Lord, that, that you will do the heart surgery that we all need to change our heart to be more mature and more perfect in your kingdom and more useful. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So he's making his greeting. He talks to Philemon. He says he loves him, his beloved co-worker, to his sister, Aphia, and to the fellow uh, soldier, Acropus, and to the church that meets in your house. This sinner has people meeting in his house to hear about Jesus. Is he a hypocrite? I'm a sinner saved by grace, and I preach against sin, and I still have problems with sin. Am I a hypocrite? If I preached that it was okay for me to sin, if I even told myself it was okay for me to sin, then I'm a hypocrite. It is not okay for me to sin. And my sin is as dark and dirty as anybody's. Does that make sense? So I, I, I must have the integrity both ways. It is not okay. Now, if I live a two-sided life and I pretend it's okay or I pretend I'm something else, then I'm a hypocrite. I'm a sinner saved by grace, just like an alcoholic is against alcohol but may slip sometimes. Does that mean that he's not on the road to recover? No. Is it okay to slip? No. He could kill people and kill himself. Is he a hypocrite to say alcohol is bad while he's still struggling with, with the affliction? No. He's on the journey. She, whoever. Right? And so, there's a difference between a hypocrite, someone who's intentionally playing the game, and someone who's struggling like all of us are until we get there. And by the way, thank you for being my support group in my struggles. Amen? God put us in groups so we could support one another in our struggles to do what's right by God. They meet in your house. May God our Father and the, uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace, undeserved favor. If we didn't have grace, could we ever see God? Do we deserve a Jesus who would die on an old rugged cross for us while we're sinning against Him? The Bible says it's on the wall back there. God commended His love towards us that while we were yet sinners, He died in our place. He died for us in our place. He took our penalty of death for our sins so that we could go free. That's grace. He says, always thank my God when I pray for you, Philemon. This guy who we found as a condemned sinner, a slave owner, but it's probably acceptable in his neighborhood, is it, was it acceptable to God? No. Was that the first thing God hit him up about? No. First thing he hit him up about was grace. Let's move you from where you are, closer to God. Get you on that walk of sanctification towards the perfection. He says, because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love of all of God's people. And I'm praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience the good things we have in Christ. The more we fall in love with Jesus, the less we love the things that are around us. Does that make sense? The more we fall in love with Jesus, when I was a young man, I used to love to ride horses and work out. Then when I got about 30, my knees didn't feel right when I've been on a horse all day. In fact, they hurt for a week at a time sometimes. And I didn't like it quite so much. But I started falling in love with Jesus, and I started loving things different. It's what I always wanted to do as a kid growing up, and then I got to a place where something was even better. 
And I couldn't tell you last time I was on a horse. I couldn't tell you last time I fell off a horse. There were several of those too. But I don't miss it. Nothing wrong with riding horses and having that kind of fun. But I love something more now. Does that make sense? It's more important to me to, to, to get to know Jesus better. Get to know His people better. Uh, share the word so more people can know it. He said, said I want you to, to put into action that, that faith and that grace that's in you. He says, your love has given me much joy and comfort. My brother. His brother's a sinner. For your kindness has always refreshed the hearts of God's people. And that is why I am boldly asking a favor of you. Sometimes it's really hard to ask a favor for somebody because they, they feel manipulated. Oh, you got close to me just so you can have this favor. Just so you can, you can misuse me. We don't mind being used of our friends. We want to be a friend and, and useful to our friends. But we don't like to be misused. So he's asking for a favor in an humble way. He says, I could demand in the name of Christ because it's the right thing for you to do. I could come and show you in the Bible what you're doing wrong and I'm doing right and I could make you eat it. <laughs> it's kind of what he's saying. I could. But instead I'm not. I'm going to come to you and ask you for a favor. Uh, when I was ordained, the, the, the gentleman who was doing the charge, the ordination charge said, Brother Darrell said, you don't drive sheep, you lead sheep. If you try to drive them, they'll bolt, they'll scatter, they'll go the which way. But if you lead them with something good, they'll follow. And so you read in the Bible about that, about the sheep know the shepherd, they know that he's going to lead them where? The green pasture, the still water. And they're going through dangerous places, they'll follow a leader that they trust. Right? And so what's Paul trying to be? A good shepherd? He says, I'm not going to make you do this. I'm going to ask you to do this. And if I've built any trust in you, I hope you'll listen to me and give, give a, 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 a favorable answer. But because of our love, I prefer simply to ask you, consider this as a request for me, Paul, an old man, now also a prisoner for the sake of Christ Jesus. This is about AD 60. Paul's probably around 60 years old or so, and he's in jail in Rome. House arrest, probably maybe tied to a guard right there close to him. And, and he says, this is me asking this of you. Now what would he go to such lengths to ask? What's so important that he's going to send a letter? Remember, that letter carries were usually somebody that was going to take it. So he's taking it from Rome, around the peninsula, or, or by sea, around Greece, and all the way to Turkey. He's sending this special delivery. This is not overnight mail. It takes a while. And yet he's making this huge request of Philemon. What's he going to ask him? He says, I appeal to you to show kindness to my child of essence. I became his father in the faith while here in prison. In other words, while he was in prison, he and Onesimus <coughs> got together and Onesimus accepted Jesus. That's what happened. So, they're there. Well, who is Onesimus? runaway slave. Who was the slave owner? Philemon. What was the penalty? What could you go up to for the runaway slave? All the way to death. And here's Onesimus. He's come. He's in Rome. Peter's met him. I mean, Paul's met him. And he's told him about Jesus Christ. He's confessed. I'm going to follow Jesus as my Lord. I know who he is. I know he was raised from death. I know about the resurrection. I know this is bigger than life because Jesus is bigger than death. Amen? I know that. And, and so, Onesimus, and by the way, his name translates to useful. <laughs> what a nice name. How many of us would like to have a name that, or, or, or have a character that was translated to useful? Because the opposite of useful is what? Useless. <clears throat> Onesimus, a slave, a runaway slave. He says, I became his father of the faith while here in prison. What year? In a place that's unlikely to be used of God. Can you still be used of God? Is this the first one that was used in prison? Or brought into a place to help you? Remember Joseph in prison for years? When he came out, he was, he was uh, over everything in the kingdom of, of under Pharaoh. You remember that? And then I remember Jesus was in an unlikely place. You know, he was dying. He was hanging on the cross. And he still had time to do some what? Witnessing. There's two people buying. 50% of them got saved that day. He presented the good news, didn't he? While dying, he was helping someone live eternal. 
And so while in prison, while in, in a tough place, horrible circumstance, everything going on, you know, he could have said, uh, Paul could have said, I'm a victim here. I'm out trying to do the right thing. And look how people are mistreating me and all that kind of stuff. God, I'm mad at you. Not that any of us would ever blame God for something. But instead, he said, I got time now. Who can I witness to? <laughs> that poor guard. He heard it probably every day. When he talks about the armor of God, he talks about the breastplate of righteousness and the girdle of truth and uh, all those out uh, there, the sword. He's probably looking at the guard and saying, Hey, guard, listen to this. This sounds pretty good. The Holy Spirit just gave you this, and I'm going to use your uniform and explain how to fight the devil. You know, he had a captive witness, a uh, uh, person to witness to him. Sometimes it's hard to get people to sit still to hear us tell about Jesus. But he had one chain to him. You know, he had it. And, and he also had time to write the prison epistles. Much of the New Testament was written while Paul had time to sit down. And he didn't have to worry, where am I going to eat? Where am I going to sleep? Is there any good security in this place? He had great security. He had armed guards around him. Right? Others called him prison. It was his workroom. It was his office. And so he's there with Onesimus, a runaway slave. He says, Onesimus hasn't been of much use to you in the past. He's playing on his name. Useful hasn't been very useful to you. He says, but now he's very useful to both of us. I'm sending it back to you, and with him comes my own heart. How much faith did it take for Onesimus to go back across, halfway across the Mediterranean Sea, or through whatever, back to someone who could put him to death? How much faith did it take? He could come up with lots of good reasons to do the wrong thing and not go back. Would you agree? He was basically free for all practical purposes. Right? And, and you wonder, I, I try to picture Onesimus, of all people in all the world, you know, uh, a peninsula away in the Mediterranean Sea from, from where he started running. And who does he run into? Paul. Oh. I just wonder how that conversation got started. And I wonder if maybe when Paul had gone by and introduced himself to Philemon and told him about Jesus and he met him in Philemon's house at all, if Onesimus as a slave saw him and said, I know that guy. <coughs> way back from my past. And I wonder if he really won't even talk to him way back from his past. I remember we some places in our past we don't want to go back to. And really don't want people that saw us to see us again. <laughs> you know? But, but he did. And he heard the truth, and he apparently Paul had had such a, 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 a witness in front of him, he wanted to hear more because he heard about Jesus Christ, and, and Paul led him to the Lord, as we say, told him about Romans 10, 9, by the way, the Holy Spirit wrote Romans 2, 10, 9 through Paul, right? <laughs> told him what it takes to get saved. He did, and now he says, okay, Onesimus, before you're truly free, before you're truly free, we're going to have to get rid of these things that are over you. These burdens. Because he lived as a hunted man until then. And says, let's pray. And let's talk to Philemon. Not as the one who's victimizing you. Not as this, to, to this evil master over there. Not all that. Let's appeal to him as a brother and a child of God. Because how much did Jesus forgive us for to allow us to be in his family? Everything. And if we don't show forgiveness to people, then what we're telling them is, I can't present evidence to you that Jesus will forgive you. I won't do that. But if you do forgive someone who's done something, and I didn't say trust, I said forgiveness. There's a difference between forgiveness and trust. You know, if every time someone came in your house, they stole everything they could get their hands on, you say, I forgive you, I forgive you. It doesn't mean you invite them into your house and say, here's the good stuff. It means I love you, I forgive you, you want a bologna sandwich or something, I'll meet you at the door. I don't want bad for you, I want you to change. I want you to have a better life. But there's a difference between forgiveness and, and trust. If we don't show forgiveness, we're not giving any evidence that it exists. Does that make sense? Oh, Jesus will forgive you of all your sin, but I'm still mad at you. What are we reflecting? What are we giving evidence of? Not of Christ, not of His ways. So he says, go back. He says, I'm sending Him back to you, and with Him comes my own heart. 
I want the best for you, Philemon, but what you're doing and what you're doing to this brother in Christ is not right. I'm not going to come down holier than thou. I'm not going to come down and tell you just how bad you are and how rotten your character is. I'm going to appeal to you out of our relationship, out of anything that I gained with you, out of the truth about who Jesus Christ is, about what He's done for you. I'm going to appeal to you that way. I'm not going to make a law and say you do it or I'm going to tell God to seek Him, God. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to love you. And I'm going to trust your love for God and your love for your neighbor as yourself. He says, let me tell you about the message. He says, I want to keep him here with me. While I'm in these chains for preaching the good news, for he has helped me on your behalf. He was useful to me. He lived up to his name to me. And I took it as a gift from you. He trained in your house. And he did it not because he was a slave, because, but because he was. He loved Paul. In brotherly love, in Christian love. He's very useful. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent. Who's he giving respect to, respect to? A dirty, rotten sinner. Can we respect dirty, rotten sinners? Can we respect dirty, rotten sinners? And let me ask brother, any such thing as clean, rotten sinners? Will sin rot you? The Bible says the wages of sin is death. It will take you to destruction. So yes, it will. And yet, who are we called to witness to? Dirty rotten sinners. Who, who, are we, who, who were we before we made Jesus? Dirty rotten sinners. That was us, right? And who does God use? Perfect people to spread His good news? No, people still fight dirty rotten sin. Amen? It's still there. And so, who is He using to fight sin and to show forgiveness and all that and be a better witness in the area of philosophy? He wants to use Philemon. Can you say no to God? How many of us are pretty good at it or have been? Sure. We can say no to God. Are we loving God every time we say no? He said, no, if you love me, you'll obey me. Anybody ever had somebody very special to you? You cared a lot about them, but there were sometimes they were not loving you. And they let you know it. Maybe some little ones. Told you no and meant it. Now, you might have taken care of it in different ways. You might have legislated morality at that moment. You can do that sometimes when they're this big. It's harder when they're this big and thinking a whole different way. But it hurts, doesn't it? When you love somebody, you would do anything for them. And they're not loving you back. Jesus would do anything for you. He'd die on the cross for you. Sometimes we don't love him back. He says, I didn't want you to do anything without your consent. He respected you. I wanted you to help because you were willing, not because you're forced. Free will is the thing that God offers all of us. That's why we can still say no to it. But oh, how beautiful it is when we say yes and we're not forced. It seems you lost Onesimus a little while so that you could have him back forever. Have you ever heard that thing, you know, if you love somebody and you set them free, if they come back to you, they're yours forever. If they go, then that's how we was supposed to be. Or that's what it's going to be. You know, he's saying... He can really be of use to you. Now, he was of no use to you in that hostile shotgun wedding of sorts. He was forced to stay there and forced to be loyal and all those kind of things. Did you ever wonder why God didn't just zap us so that we're forced to follow him? Because that's not how he does it. He offers us freedom that we come back to him where he is. He said, you can have him back forever. He is no longer like a slave to you. He's more than a slave. He is a beloved brother. He's now a blood relative. Whose blood? The blood of Jesus Christ. He's now a blood brother. The laws didn't say that uh, Philemon had to do this. He didn't have to listen to Paul. The issue was, was there a genuine conversion in his heart that he could love his brother as himself? And did he recognize another Christian as his brother or sister? So if you consider me your partner, did he say, if you consider me an apostle with all the powers and stuff like that, that, that you're going to do, because you know I heard the record from God, and you better do it or you're going to, did he do all that? No, he said, if you consider me a partner, 
welcome him as you would welcome me. What divides people? Sometimes it doesn't take much, does it? You know, uh, there's a big thing about race in the United States, but it hadn't been that many years ago over in Uganda where they're killing each other. And it's one race, but they look a little different, and they're killing each other with machetes by the thousands. What does it take for people to go against one another? The North and the South are going against each other over ideas by the thousands, hundreds of thousands. What does it take to go against each other? They talk about black lives and blue lives and, and all these other lives out there. What does it take to, to, to wind up hating each other enough to want to, to kill one another? Not much. We, we, can, we can do the victim thing. Well, this group is what's causing me problems, so I hate them. We can do the victim thing or the insecure thing where this group looks different than me, so I'm scared of them, so i got, I got to get rid of them. We can do the thing, well, they're stopping me from getting what I want. I'll get them out of my way. All those things are do things to divide us. And you hear the politicians talking about uniter, not a divider, and all these, these wonderful words. Who is the ultimate uniter? Jesus is. And he's talking to a slave and to a slave owner and saying, you know what? You're now brothers. We're all. So what would be the answer to the relationship between Onesimus and Philemon? Jesus. And what Jesus has done, his love that he's poured out, not love that he just expressed in words, but love that he expressed in deeds. Right? Look what he said. I love this line. Look what he says. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. Charge it to me. I will pay his penalty. Who does that sound like? Jesus said, it, remember over here it says the ways of sin or the punishment for sin or the penalty of sin is death. And Jesus said, well, if that's what's keeping them out of heaven, put it on me. I will pay whatever is owed. And what did he have to pay for us to go to heaven? Death. Amen? Death. Put it on me. And Christians, if we're going to go and we're going to present the gospel, we're going to have to do what? Bear one another's burdens, sometimes one another's debts. Put it on me if it will put y'all where you need to be moving further to Jesus Christ. Not as a victim, but as a champion. Not as a victim, but as a warrior for the kingdom of God. Not as a victim, but for an ambassador for the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Put it on me. I'll take the hit. If it will do what? Reconcile where we need to be and build the witness it needs to be. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Could you trust Paul? Had he built that, that he had to build it with Philemon. He was just some guy walking through town one day, but Philemon found him and trusted him about Jesus Christ and found out he could trust him about a lot of other things. And so Paul said, Look, this is my writing. This isn't some con game. I've built credibility with you. If you believe it, put it on me. And you two can go be free in your relationship. Yes, my brethren, please do this favor for the Lord's sake. Why? What would it tell people? Way more than earthly values or earthly cultural structures or social structures, I put God first. And if I put God first, things such as slavery, things such as isms, racism, nationalisms, whatever isms that come up, they're way down here. I found something better. Loving Jesus and want his kingdom to grow. Please do this for the Lord's sake. Give me this encouragement in Christ. He said, I'll be rooting for you, Philemon. I want you to have this freedom. I want you to be able to go forward and, and, and continue that sanctification process and get closer to that perfection. I am confident as I write this letter that you will do more what I ask and even more. He said, you're going to do more than what I ask and even more than that. Because who's in Philemon now that he's made Jesus his Lord? The Bible says, when you believe, the Holy Spirit comes and seals you until the day of redemption. The Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit changes and draws us to places to do better things. Not of our own goodness, but of his leadership. And so that his kingdom can grow. And then he says this. One more thing. Please prepare a guest for me. For I'm hoping that God will answer your prayers 
He knows that Philemon's been praying for him while he's in jail. And let me return to you. Philemon, you and I, we still have a relationship. I didn't go through town and notch my Bible. I got one more. I got a new merit badge on my, my Christian robe. And all. He didn't do that. He said, Philemon, you're an important person in my life. You're, you're credible in my life. I'm not misusing you here. We're partners in this estate. He goes on and talks about some other people in the last three, three verses of the book of Philemon. We did pretty good. A whole book. Y'all might tell your friends about it that we would finish it in one sermon time. A whole book. But what's going to heal this land? If my people, they're called by my name, Christians, or humble themselves, <coughs> see God's face. Look to God and get Him to look at you. And what? Humble themselves and pray, see God's face. He says, then I'll hear from heaven and I'll forgive those sins and I'll heal the land. Or we can uh, we can protest and we can holler at one another about this political thing or that political thing. Or we can find more and more differences and, and we can try to get our anger out and we can show how much bigger and badder and all that than we are than somebody else. We can call each other's names. Hey, which way do we want to do it, church? As God would lead us? Or as the world says, this is how you get things done. Which one has proven himself? Have you ever noticed when the world really gets good at hating one another? We kill a bunch of each other? World War I, World War II. They, they didn't have to give World War I a name to begin with. They just called it the Great War. Then they had World War II. They had to go back and rename World War I. Get them in order. Amen? In this time of great technological advances, since the 1900s till now, we've gotten better at killing each other than we've ever been. But God's Word hadn't changed. I pray that where God has planted you and planted me in our communities, that we'll put the kingdom of God first. We'll seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and trust that God will add everything else we need. I pray that we will humble ourselves and pray. I pray that we will invest ourselves in relationships with other people and watch God use that relationship to get away from the things that are not of God. I think he called the group out just to do those very things. And that group is called his what? Church. His church. Sometimes called his bride. Sometimes called his army. Amen? If you're not a part of the bride of Christ, if you've never said, Jesus is my Lord, I mean that with all my heart. He's the one that died for me, and he's the one that was bigger than death was raised from the dead. If you've done that, the Bible says you will be saved. You're a part of his church. And now you have a mission. And the mission is not to join the social structure of the world and what's politically correct or sounds good for the moment, but for the timeless truths of Jesus Christ. If you've never done that before, we invite you to today. A bunch of what? People who still have the effects of dirty, rotten sin, but have an amazing Savior every day and an awesome support group called His church. Let's stand in front of you.